My name is Katie Williams. I'm a pediatrician at the University of Wisconsin-Madison working on a medical genetics fellowship. And during my training, you are welcome to come up here, buddy. Um, during my training, I've had the opportunity to work with Bob Steiner in Metabolic Bone Disease Clinic and had a chance to work with a few families uh, who have children with smith lemley opitz syndrome. Um, I'm very, very um, thankful for the opportunity to come and speak here today. Throughout my time as a general pediatrician, I worked very closely with children with genetic disorders and their families, and I feel like these family days are a really powerful event, not only for you as families to support one another, uh, but for us as as physicians and, and healthcare providers to really learn how to care for, for children better. Um, that parental perspective is something that we, in rare instances, only we usually don't understand directly. Um, so it's helpful to get that perspective from you. And um, I've had the fortune of working with great scientists and, and mentors during my medical training, but I think most of my um, learning about what it takes to be a doctor has come from the children and the families that we serve. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for, um, in, for allowing me to be here today. So I'm giving the kind of the introductory talk, the smith Lindley Opitz 101, kind of the basics about uh, this condition. I have just a few short objectives for the talk today. First, to review the discovery of smith Lemley Opitz syndrome and its underlying cause, describe the clinical features of SLOS and the recommended medical care. Uh, discuss the rash and then lastly discuss the rationale behind various treatment approaches for SLOS. So for families that have been to the conference before or ha are caring for a child, an older child, a lot of this will be review, but hopefully for some of you that are either new to the conference or new to learning about SLOS, uh, there'll be some new pieces of information here. And, and really this talk is, is the basics. You're gonna hear from experts in all of these areas that will give you, a, you know, insight into each of these individual topics, but hopefully this will serve as, as a basic foundation. So the original description of smith lemley Opitz syndrome actually came from uh, three doctors, Dr. Smith, Dr. Lemley, and Dr. Opitz, who were working at the University of Wisconsin, which is where I'm currently training. This is a picture of the original medical school. Um, it no longer served, or, sorry, it was originally the hospital, um, served as the medical school for a number of years and is now, uh, has some training um, roles as well, but is also a research facility. And uh, the three doctors published a paper in 1964 that described a newly recognized syndrome of multiple congenital anomalies, which is a cold medical term for just saying um, differences in how the structure of the body were formed that were present at birth. Congenital sounds like it implies genetics, but it doesn't always. It just means that it was present at birth. And this is the picture of the three cute boys that were first described in, in the paper. Um, you can see in the caption below the pictures that it, it has their initials, and you'll, know it's, you'll notice that the last names are S, R, and H, so sometimes you will um, hear about this condition described as RSH syndrome, and that's named after the first three children who were described with this disorder. And the three boys shared characteristic, or shared similar facial appearances, certain medical concerns, and they felt that there was probably a common diagnosis shared among the three boys. And in their paper, even in 1964, I thought this was a really insightful um, quote from the paper, the syndrome is presented with the hope that other cases will be recognized, allowing for the further definition of the condition and its etiology. And so over the next 30 years, that's exactly what happened. More children were identified with this condition and we were able to learn that um, they shared some features with those three boys who were, who were originally described, but there was a much broader clinical spectrum than what was initially presented. And in 1994, Opitz wrote some, er some conclusions from these early observations, kind of what they lessons they had learned from these first 30 years of studying SLOS. Um, one of them was that none of the individual characteristics were pathognomonic of the disorder, meaning there wasn't a, a one clinical feature that you could say, this is unique to SLOS, this really raises my suspicion for it, um, that, that would really kind of draw you to that diagnosis. None of the individual characteristics were obligatory, meaning there wasn't one characteristic that had to be present in order to make that diagnosis. The condition varied enormously in expressivity, meaning some people had very mild symptoms, some people had more severe symptoms. And the occurrence in many, ra in many races from unrelated parents indicated this was a relatively common disorder, meaning uh, at, that, at that point it was, no, it was 
believed to be a genetic disorder, but it was occurring in a number of different populations, so this genetic variant or genetic predisposition uh, must be relatively common. And around the same time, uh, finally, there was, some, um, there was some light shed on the underlying mechanism for SLOS. Uh, Tint et al. reported in 1994 um, differences in cholesterol metabolism among individuals with smith lemley opitz syndrome. So this is the figure from their paper from 1994, and it's showing all the different chemical structures um, that are involved in the synthesis of cholesterol. So these are just, all these little arrows indicate chemical reactions that are converting one chemical structure to another. And where you see that little X at the bottom here uh, is, is uh, the kind of chemical reaction or the, the step in this metabolic pathway that that is usually impaired in individuals with SLOS, and it leads to less cholesterol being made and more of that 7-dehydrocholesterol uh, circulating in the body. So fast forward to today, what have we learned since then? We know that um, SLOS is diagnosed in about one out of every 20,000 to 60,000 live births. Um, and it's, it's found to be a little more common in individuals of Northern or Central European ancestry and less common in individuals with Asian or African ancestry. We've also been able, now that we understand the genetic etiology of SLOS, we know that approximately one in 30 individuals are carriers of a genetic change um, that can cause SLOS. Um, if you kind of do the mathematical modeling of how many children then, based on the carrier frequency, how many children we should be seeing born with SLOS, we are, uh, the prevalence is much less than what we would expect. Uh, there's probably a number of reasons for that. Some babies who are very severely affected may not survive pre pregnancy, may not make it to full term, and so we never have the opportunity to meet those children. And then there are children who are very mildly affected that are probably um, haven't been diagnosed or children that have been very severely affected and didn't have the typical clinical features of SLOS and were missed as well. So there are a number of clinical features that can be seen in individuals with SLOS, certainly as you look through this list and you think about your own children. So some of these uh, um, clinical issues will apply to your child and many will not. Um, in general, children with SLOS tend to, slow, uh, tend to grow a little bit on the slower side and can have some delays in their development, maybe walk a little bit later or have some difficulties with walking. Um, Intellectual disability can be present, but is highly variable. Some people are mildly affected, while others are more, are more significantly affected. Low muscle tone can be present, which makes walking and some of those other motor milestones a little more challenging. Many children have sleep issues and require very little sleep at night. There can be some uh, behavior issues or autistic features in children with SLOS. Uh, some of you may have noticed the sensitivity of light or eczema or other skin issues. Um, there are some characteristic facial features and, and shape to the head that can be seen in children with SLOS but are not universally present. So in general, the head size tends to be a little bit smaller, uh, the jaw a little bit smaller, that, uh, the palate or the kind of the top of your mouth tends to be a little bit arched. Um, some children can actually have a cleft palate which is sort of on the same spectrum as, as that highly arched palate, and then something called holoprosencephaly, which is a, a really significant difference in how the brain is formed so that it doesn't develop into two lobe structures. It stays as one um, and then can cause some characteristic facial appearances to go along with it. Many children with SLOS have some eye issues that need attention. Some kids can have some eye drooping, which itself is not problematic, but if it covers, if it interferes enough with, with their ability to see, it can be problematic. Children can develop um, a lazy eye or drifting of one of the eyes, cataracts, and for some children, their optic nerves are a little bit under, underdeveloped and can interfere with vision. Many of you have probably seen or heard of uh, heart malformations, which are just structural differences in the heart that are often present at birth. Um, septal defects are the, the wall of the heart between the two chambers, um, either the top atria or the bottom ventricles. Um, a patent ductus arteriosus is just kind of a, a um, it's a sort of a bypass vessel that's used for babies during development, and sometimes that can remain, in, in, in typical babies it closes during the first week of life, but in some babies it stays open and needs to be um, closed either with medications or with surgeries. 
um, AV canal is another type of, of heart malformation and also high blood pressure. Feeding issues tend to be a topic of conversation among, I'm learning very quickly, even among the families here today. Um, there can be some severe um, medical issues that can arise from the digestive tract. Pyloric stenosis is a narrowing of the muscle that, that kind of forms the outflow tract of the stomach, connects the stomach to the, the small intestine. And if that's very narrow, it can cause some feeding difficulties and vomiting. Hirschsprung's disease is a difference in how the kind of um, last parts of our bowels are innervated. And um, individuals with that lack of proper innervation can develop some constipation and dilation of the bowel as well. Intestinal malrotation just means that the intestine kind of folded and looped in an atypical way when the child was developing and some children can have some feeding difficulties or uh, some um, problems with intestinal blockage over time. Constipation, just run-of-the-mill constipation that we see in any children can be present. Uh, reflux or kind of that um, refluxing up of the, the stomach contents or acids from the stomach in babies or older children that can be, pro can be bothersome. Feeding issues like lack of uh, strong appetite or difficulty coordinating, um, coordinating uh, swallow. And then cholestatic liver disease, a particular type of liver disease that's typically seen in severely affected individuals but can be seen in all children. And uh, the, ki the kidney and genitals can be formed a little bit differently. So uh, particularly in boys, the external genitals might be a little bit underdeveloped or shaped a little bit differently than what we typically expect. The testicles can be undescended and may need a surgical procedure to pull them down. Um, and then there can be some kidney malformations. Sometimes those don't have any effect on kidney function. Sometimes they can make um, individuals a little more likely to, to develop bladder infections. And then for on the outside, sometimes uh, you can notice some shortening of the arms. The two, three toe syndactyly is something that we see in all individuals, but very commonly in individuals with SLOS. Um, extra fingers or toes, particularly on the hands, on the kind of the far side of the hands here, and then short thumbs. So lots of different clinical features. Some apply to your children, some may not. Um, and from, as, from a geneticist standpoint, um, can make this a really challenging diagnosis because there is such a wide clinical spectrum, um, and this is probably a, a, rel is a relatively common disorder, so it can be hard to identify children. And we talked a little bit about the typical facial features. I think whenever a, a, a new genetic condition is described, we, we have kind of a narrow view of what, what that looks like. And I think for the facial features, that was probably true with SLOS. As we've found more and more children with this disorder, we find that not every child has the typical facial features and, and sort of changes our impression of what typical really is. So really every child unique in his or her own way. So over time, going back to this underlying cause to kind of um, help us understand why we're seeing some of the health issues that we see, uh, cholesterol is uh, a, a fatty substance that's present in all of our bodies. It's something that our bodies make, or our, our, our bodies typically make, and then we take some in from the diet as well. And it serves a number of different roles in the body. It's a precursor for steroid hormones, which are natural hormones that our bodies make um, in order to carry out a variety of, of functions within our body. They help with bone min mineralization, um, maintaining um, or um, our, our stress response, uh, helping with uh, puberty and um, lots of other functions throughout, throughout our bodies. Cholesterol is also needed to synthesize bile acids, which help us uh, absorb nutrients from the foods that we eat. It's important for embryonic development. So when you think back to some of those clinical features, differences in how the heart formed, differences in how um, the intestine kind of folded and wrapped up and was tucked into the body, there, there was a role for cholesterol in that process. And then cellular membranes. Um, the outside of all of our cells are kind of like a lipid raft and they have cholesterol stuck within that lip lipid raft um, that helps keep the cells intact and allow them to carry out their function. So, Cholesterol is really a fundamental nutrient that's needed in a variety of ways in our body. And cholesterol, um, the, cholesterol is synthesized in our body as well as taken in from the diet, and the synthesis depends on a number of, um, of properly functioning genes. So I sort of think of genes in really simple terms as our instruction book for how our bodies are put together. 
Um, and if you wrote down all of those genes for each of us, put them on paper, bound them into books, they would fill an entire bookshelf full of books. It's an, an immense amount of, of information. And each cell in our body, our smallest units in our cell, almost all the cells in our body carry around a copy of this, this instruction book with it. And let me see. This is a picture of just a typical cell. And you can see in the nucleus, the center of the cell, are these little X-shaped um, units called chromosomes. These are just kind of the blocks of genetic material that our bodies carry around. And if you unravel them, you see a long ribbon-like structure that has a, a really um, simple chemical code. And it's sort of like letters of the alphabet. Um, and there can be differences, there are differences in all, of our genetic, in all of our genetic material. We all have little differences in the spelling of each of our genes. Most of the time it doesn't cause any health issues, but if you have a spelling change that's either very large or that's in a really critical part of that code, then sometimes you can see medical concerns that will arise. And it does that because this is, kind of serves as a blueprint for how our bodies make something called a protein. A protein is a, a sort of a string of chemicals called amino acids, and that protein, protein has some job to do in the body. Sometimes it can be a structural protein, like proteins in our hair or our skin that give it its strength and elasticity. Sometimes it can be a, a pigment in our red blood cells that helps us transport oxygen. Um, and in the case of smith lumley opitz there is a gene that codes for a protein that helps carry out a chemical reaction that allows our body to make cholesterol. So this is, this is the reaction that I was alluding to. So cholesterol is synthesized from something called 7-dehydrocholesterol. Chemically, they look very similar. There's just a slight change here. Um, on 7 dehydrocholesterol, that those two lines implies that there is a double bond, and there's a chemical reaction that, that occurs that changes that into a single line or a single bond. And the protein or enzyme that does that is something called 7 dehydrocholesterol reductase. And over time, uh, what we've learned is that children with smith lumley opitz syndrome um, have a, an enzyme that's 7 dehydrocholesterol that, that doesn't work quite as well as what uh, typical children do. And so that reaction doesn't go along as, as well as it does in other children. And the blueprint for that protein is a gene called DHCR7. And that is the, the blueprint that provides the instructions for that enzyme 7 dehydrocholesterol reductase. So if we zoom out a little bit farther and look at cholesterol synthesis, it's not just one chemical going from another, it's sort of an assembly line of chemicals running down um, and you can see this is the step that isn't working quite as well in children with SLOS, that step converting 7-dehydrocholesterol to cholesterol. And so what you see, you know, if you think of this as sort of an assembly line, if you have people each doing a, a particular task, and then at one of those breakpoints, um, someone's not able to complete that task, and everyone else keeps completing their task ahead of them. You're gonna get a buildup of whatever it is that you're making right around that area. And that's what we see in our bodies too. You'll get an increase in 7-dehydrocholesterol upstream of that step that's not working as well. And then that sort of spills over into another chemical or another compound called 8-dehydrocholesterol. So you see increases in both of these. These are some blood levels of cholesterol, 7-dehydrocholesterol and 8-dehydrocholesterol in children with um, smith lumley opitz syndrome. And you can see um, the cholesterol levels, I mean, you probably all go into the doctor, had your cholesterol level checked. Um, it would usually, we you know, aim for a, the good cholesterol to be around 100 or total cholesterol to be a little bit above that. And you can see this, this top area, some children with smith lumley opitz syndrome have cholesterol ranges that are in what you would typically expect. But many of them have quite, quite low cholesterol. Some of them, you know, less than, less than 10 or five in some of these regions. So really, really low cholesterol because their body's just not able to synthesize it very well. But about 10% of children will have a normal cholesterol despite having that genetic change in that gene. 7 dehydrocholesterol and 8 dehydrocholesterol are typically not present in very high quantities in, in people who don't have SLOS, but in children who do, you can see that those levels are elevated. So this is often uh, one of the first tests that we order if we have a suspicion that a child has SLOS, we look for this marker in the blood, but it may not always be present. So this is a genetic disorder, meaning that it, it can run in families, and it does so in what we call an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. 
So if we're in each of our genetic materials, our genetic instruction book, we have two copies of every gene that we, that we need. So that gene for making um, cholesterol from 7-dehydrocholesterol, each of us in this room has two copies of it. Um, in some genetic disorders, only one of those copies has to have a change that um, sort of interferes with its function in order to call, cause health problems. In SLOS, you need a change in both of your copies of that gene. That's why it's called a recessive rather than dominant condition. And so when a child does have SLOS, we know, and we can do genetic testing to show that they have both copies have some genetic change that interferes with its function. Um, both of those genes came from the child's parents, so it means that the parents must have one copy of, each parent must have one copy of that, um, of a gene that, that has a genetic change as well. So this kind of shows this in a nice picture form. Um, these, this is mom and dad here. They're each kind of half blue, half white, meaning that they have one gene that is functional, one gene that is not. Typically, they, they will not have any health problems as a result of that because they have that one backup copy that sort of covers for the copy that's not working perfectly. When they come together and have children, they'll each pass down randomly one copy of those genes to their children, and then they'll combine um, in that new child. So there's a 25% chance that they'll both pass down the copy that works just fine. That child will be unaffected. They're not a carrier. It wouldn't be expected that they would have um, any children who were affected with SLOS if they chose to have children of their own. 50% of the time, um, children will be, just like their parents, carriers of SLOS, meaning they have one copy of the gene that works just fine, one copy that doesn't work as well. Uh, they shouldn't have any health problems as a result of it, but when they have children of their own, if they do so with a carrier, there's a chance that they could have a child with SLOS. And 25% of the time, the child will inherit both copies, one copy from each parent of the gene that, um, that isn't working well, and they'll, be, they'll have SLOS. Now, if we looked in each of our genetic um, instruction books, we're all carriers for something. There's not, there's not a person in this room that's not a carrier for something. We have no control over what we have, and we don't have any control over how that's handed down. So there's nothing that someone does during pregnancy or during their lifetime that increases or decreases their risk of being a carrier or passing that on to their children. It's just a matter of chance. So um, early on, even before babies are born, um, there are some clues that we, can, that we can see that a child might be affected with SLOS. So on prenatal ultrasound, sometimes you can see that the fetus isn't growing as well as what we typically expect. If you see some differences in how the brain, heart, kidneys, or limbs are forming, that can sometimes be a clue. And then in, in developing boys, if the genitalia looks underdeveloped, that can be a clue that a child has SLOS. There are lots of laboratories that we do on, on pregnant women. A lot of them, um, these first three, the S trial, HCG, and alpha fetoprotein, are part of routine screening, looking for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, looking for common genetic disorders that can have significant health effects on the baby. In children with SLOS, S trial tends to be on the lower side. Thinking back, cholesterol is a precursor for lots of hormones, including S trial, so that tends to be on the lower side. Um, HCG, a, a hormone that's produced during pregnancy, is low. And then alpha fetoprotein is something that we screen for, looking for high levels in children with neural tube defects, but it can actually be quite low in, in developing babies that have SLOS. And then unique to, to moms who are carrying um, a child with SLOS, moms can have elevations in what's called equine sterols. Equine means horse. Um, they are not carrying a developing horse, but they are carrying a baby that, uh, because of the difference in the metabolism of cholesterol, produces a different type of, of hormone that circulates in mom's body. It's not typically seen in pregnant women, um, but it is similar to a sterile that is seen in, in horses, and so that's why it's named that way. And then once a baby's born, there's some clinical features that can clue us into the diagnosis of, of smith lumley opitz syndrome. Some children will have that characteristic facial features or those characteristic facial features, while others uh, will have their own unique facial features. Two throat, two, uh, three toe syndactyly by itself doesn't, isn't a strong implication of um, smith lumley opitz syndrome, but if it's seen with other health issues, it can be a clue. The head size can be smaller if babies are struggling with feeding and growing or um, having some delays in their milestones. In boys, if the genitals are underdeveloped, um, children with cleft palate, or those with extra fingers or toes. 
And often if we see those clinical features, we'll look for other markers to support our suspicion that the child has SLOS. So um, we talked about how that 7-dehydrocholesterol is, is elevated in children with SLOS and is a unique feature. So that's often one of the first tests that we will draw. And typically it's elevated, but sometimes can be normal. Cholesterol levels can be measured and oftentimes are low, but in 10% of, of children with SLOS will be normal. And then regardless of what clinical features or laboratory testing um, we have, it's recommended that children have molecular testing or genetic testing to, to really confirm that the child has two genetic changes that we know interfere with the function of both copies of those genes. Okay. So now what do we do? We have a child with SLOS that's going to need specialized care. Um, there's sort of a list of things that are recommended for babies or children at the time of diagnosis. A detailed history and physical examination to make sure that we're capturing the whole story of what is going on with that child and addressing all the needs of that family. A developmental assessment to see where that child is in their social development, their language skills, their gross motor skills, and see if there's any therapies that can be applied to help that child develop well an eye exam to look for some of those eye problems that we discussed earlier, under development of the optic nerve, um, visual problems, cataracts, things like that. An echocardiogram or EKG. Not all children with a heart malformation will have a murmur or any other signs that they are having heart problems. Um, and sometimes it may just come out during illness or with some other stress on the body. So even if a child appears healthy, it's a good idea just to get that ultrasound of the heart to look for structural differences. And then an EKG looks at the kind of electrical rhythms that allow the heart to beat. Brain imaging is, us is often recommended, but it doesn't have to be done urgently. It can wait until a child is at an age where um, anesthesia is a little bit lower in risk or that they're older where they can sit for the image. Um, oftentimes the brain imaging will be normal, but there can be some differences in how the brain structure formed. Hearing loss can be common, so a hearing evaluation is recommended. Uh, laboratories to look for signs of adrenal or liver issues. So we talked about how cholesterol is a precursor for a lot of steroid hormones, including our adrenal hormones, which are really important for stress response. And we use that um, during times of illness. So children with kind of low levels of adrenal function, if they're put through a stressful situation like a really bad illness or a surgery, um, if they don't have an adequate stress response, they can have problems with low blood pressure um, or, or um, problems kind of maintaining blood flow throughout the body that can um, be pretty significant and severe. So you want to make sure that that child's stress response is robust to get them through whatever um, st stress on the body lies ahead. And then liver issues, we talked about the liver disease that can be present, um, not always present, but um, can be present, but um, looking at laboratories to see if any of, the, any of those signs are there. And then consultation with a clinical geneticist, just to go over the test results with the family, explain the inheritance pattern so that families understand um, you know, where this genetic change came from and what their chance would be of having a future child with SLOS. After diagnosis, there's ongoing medical care that is, is recommended for children with SLOS. So um, keeping a good conversation, keeping up good conversation with families, continuing to do a detailed history and physical examination, looking for um, clues in the history or on physical exam that a child may have a health need that needs addressing, ongoing developmental assessments and therapies a nutritional assessment with SLOS growth curve. So when we, we, when we know a particular genetic condition causes impairments in growth, oftentimes if there are enough children um, with that particular condition, we can develop disorder-specific growth curves. So we have these for disorders like Down syndrome or achondroplasia where we know children are not meant to grow on the typical growth curve. So we should compare them to their peers, not to typically growing individuals. We should, we should um, not... Um, not expect them to grow in a way that their body wasn't made to do. Um, so there are special growth curves for children with SLOS so that we're, um, we're assessing them correctly. And then oftentimes people will do ongoing laboratories looking at cholesterol levels, 7-dehydrocholesterol levels, 8-dehydrocholesterol, or liver transaminases. This is a picture of the SLOS growth curve for weight in young children, uh, 0 to 16 years, and it's compared to the CDC growth curves. Those are the typical growth curves that we, that we use for typical children. And the typical ones are these dotted lines here. The black line is kind of the upper end of normal. The blue dotted lines are the average growth curves. And then the 
bottom uh, dashed lines are the lower end of normal for typically growing children. For children with SLOS, they're in the solid lines here. So this is the upper end of normal, which is below that of typically growing children, but still within the healthy range for typically growing children. Um, and then the, the average range is more on the lower end of normal for typically growing children. And a typical child with SLOS will be, the lower end of normal is below that of typically um, growing children. So there's lots of supportive treatment that we can do for children with SLOS therapy services, whether that's speech therapy, occupational therapy, or, um, or uh, physical therapy to help encourage development um, and working on things like walking and, and, and talking and, and developing as, as much as a child can. Uh, feeding tubes can be a great help for children who are struggling with oral intake, whether it's because they don't have a strong appetite or they have difficulty coordinating uh, a swallow. Uh, feeding tubes can be a nice way to provide that nutrition in a way that doesn't require the child to do it all by themselves. Um, there are cholesterol or bile acid therapies for liver disease. Eye uh, issues can often be repaired surgically. Um, children that have polydactyly at some point usually have that repaired just because it, it can get in the way and be a little cumbersome at times. Um, tympanostomy tubes, those are the ear tubes that go in the eardrums for children who have frequent ear infections. And then for uh, the children who are sensitive to the sun, UV protective clothing and sunscreen. So next, I just wanted to touch on the very basics of some of the treatments that you'll hear about later today. You're going to get to hear from experts in all of these areas, um, so I won't go into great detail, but I just wanted to touch on each of the topics that you might hear about later today, just so that you have a, a sense of where that idea for the treatment came about. So one of the treatments that you'll hear about is cholesterol or bile acid supplementation. And we know that in children with SLOS, their bodies don't make as much cholesterol as what they, a typical child would. Um, and cholesterol is a precursor for bile acids. So um, those, that cholesterol is important for steroid hormones, embryonic development, and cellular membranes as well. So in a child that's not making it on their own, one therapeutic approach is just to supplement it directly. So if you can't make something, just take it orally, and hopefully that will replace the body, or will, um, will be sufficient for the body's needs. There are some problems with this. Uh, cholesterol doesn't pass the blood-brain barrier, which is sort of a protective area around the brain um, that is, is very picky about what it lets um, into that area and get direct exposure to the brain. And we know that a lot of the effects of um, SLOS are, are, are related to development. And so it is helpful if something could cross the blood-brain barrier and um, provide the cholesterol that the body's not making in, uh, itself. Um, there's also a, a body of evidence or a, an idea that um, that drugs called HMC or HMG CoA reductase inhibitors can be helpful in in children with uh, Smith Lumley Opitz syndrome. This is sort of counterintuitive. These are the medications that we use to lower our cholesterol, the statins or other cholesterol lowering medications that you've heard about. And the idea it might sound kind of counterintuitive, but this is the rationale behind it. So we know in children with SLOS, they're not making as much cholesterol, and they're making, or the, and as a result of that, they have higher levels of 7-dehydrocholesterol as well as 8-dehydrocholesterol. And the idea is that perhaps the accumulation of those two types of lipids in the body have some harmful effects on the body. And so if we inhibit a chemical reaction upstream of that and reduce the amount of 7-dehydrocholesterol or 8-dehydrocholesterol that could have some benefit on the body. And then you'll also hear about antioxidant supplementation. Again, in children, you have the increase in both the 7 and 8-dehydrocholesterol, and there's some thought that maybe they produce uh, secondary antioxidant stress. And so um, if we can't, if we can't uh, decrease the absolute amount of those two uh, lipids in the body, then perhaps we can uh, we can um, kind of suppress the, the negative impact that they may have on the body as well. And then there's additional therapies that are always in discussions with just about any um, genetic disorder, things like stem cell therapy or gene therapy. Stem cells are, are our body's kind of undifferentiated cells. They haven't declared themselves as a heart cell or a kidney cell or a, a, a neuronal cell. Um, and so sometimes they can serve as really great models for different disorders. And in some cases, if there's a, a tissue that has had some um, developmental change as a result of a condition, there's the, there's the um, theoretical possibility that, that can be, be repaired by the use of stem cells. 
Gene therapy is um, a new technique that actually has been um, recently just FDA approved for a different genetic disorder where um, we're able to actually insert a functional gene in a child who has a genetic change that makes that copy of that gene not functional. Um, and then prenatal cholesterol supplementation. So instead of waiting until the child's born, supplementing moms with cholesterol in the hopes that maybe that would, would lessen some of the heart malformations or differences in brain structure formation and other issues that happen well before the baby is born. And then I just wanted to list uh, a couple resources for families. I think you've already found, by the fact, the fact that you're here, you found your best resource, this, this parent organization. Um, but there is also uh, rare disease clinical trials or, sorry, Rare Disease Clinical Research Network and clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, that's, a, that's a site that I refer almost all of my patients to. It always gives the most up-to-date information about what trials are recruiting or have been recently completed um, related to any particular disorder. And so it can give you an idea of what sorts of areas are being researched and ways that you can get involved if that's something that you wish to do. So with that, I'll take any questions if people have them. Um, for the new research with the gene therapy, you were saying that they could substitute the gene to make it workable. Is that something that's only done in utero, or is that something that can be done after they're born? Mm -hmm. So the one that's been approved is not for SLOS, it's for a, a disorder called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and that's a condition where babies are born um, with a genetic change that interferes with the nerve's ability to sort of stimulate the muscles to uh, contract and, and move around. And so our muscles, if they don't get stimulated and they don't um, contract, they, they don't grow and they sort of, um, they decrease in size and that's what the atrophy part of that is. So um, when they're born, they have everything in place um, healthy muscles, they just need a genetic, they just need a repair of that gene so that the nerves will fire correctly. So in that particular condition, the gene therapy is given right away at birth, um, hopefully before any of that atrophy has begun, and then it allows the nerves to stimulate the muscles normally, and they do see a, a great improvement in how the children develop. You know, children that typically wouldn't be able to walk are, are able to walk, um, so there's definitely been a, a big improvement with that. Some of the limitations would be that, you know, if, if a child is born with a heart defect or a difference in how their brain formed, it's unlikely that gene therapy after the baby's born is going to correct that, but it can correct some of the ongoing issues, potentially. I'm not aware that anyone has done gene therapy in a developing baby for any disorder at all. Right. Right, but that would be the next step if that, becomes, if that becomes more broadly applicable and we find ways to more effectively apply gene therapy to babies once they're first born, that will be the next question. Is there something that we can do for a developing baby to help them along? But as of right now, that's still down the road for all disorders. We also have a standing mic here, so if you think of a question and wanna just um, come up and answer, um, ask it. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, the liver disease, is that typically present at birth or does it later develop? And, and just a second question for the adrenal hormones. Mm -hmm. um, is there symptoms if they're low and how often should they be tested if you're not sure? So the liver disease, my understanding is that typically is more severe in more severely affected individuals. Is that a fair thing to say? So I think if a child is really severely affected, has a lot of, um, you know, a really severe heart malformation, brain malformation, other, other things that are present at birth, that the liver disease could be present early on. Is it something that typically develops over time? Or if it's not there from the beginning, it can. It can develop over time. And then your second question was about the adrenal function. There... The signs of it can be harder to tell um, just by looking at the child or caring for the child. So it can lead to some electrolyte abnormalities. So if a child goes in, if they're sick and they go in because they're dehydrated or something, there can be some signs on their electrolytes, their sodiums, and uh, the sodium can be very, very low and their potassium can be very high, which you typically don't see with dehydration, but you can see with poor adrenal function in, during a stressful situation. Um, blood glucose can sometimes be harder to maintain if you don't have an adequate stress response as well. So some things you might see is that the child just just doesn't look 
good, that they're really jittery or that they just look like they're very, very ill, even in the setting of a, a, what you would expect to be more of a mild illness. Fortunately, you don't have to wait until that happens. There are uh, lab tests that you can do to make sure that the child's stress response is normal. And typically an endocrinologist or a specialist in that field can then follow the child to make sure that that's, um, that's healthy over time. Is that a fair? Yeah. Anyone can add in. So, hi, I'm Ellen Elias. So, my experience with some of my patients with more severe um, issues with SLO is if you know you're having surgery, say you need uh, your cleft palate repaired or a more major surgery, some of my, oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm vertically challenged. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so if you have, some of my patients have had a bigger surgery like a scoliosis repair or something like that, or also with a severe illness. Mm -hmm. If um, the child is hospitalized with say pneumonia or um, an illness severe enough to have a high fever and often be in the hospital, um, many of my patients have needed extra steroids, we call that stress steroids, mm -hmm. to help them to get through either a severe illness or the stress of surgery. Um, I usually look for that, um, for there are special tests that an endocrinologist can help with to identify if there is a concern of the adrenal gland not being able to make hormones and there are um, pretty routine um, protocols for giving extra stress steroids, we call them, that my families know about in those kids who need it. Not everybody needs it. The more mildly affected kids usually don't. If mm -hmm. your cholesterol is up higher, um, 100 or more certainly, or close to 100 or more, usually your adrenals can function pretty well, mm -hmm. even with stress. But um, that has actually been a life-saving intervention for some of my patients whose adrenal glands are not don't have enough cholesterol as the substrate to make the stress hormones with, and giving them stress steroids has helped them do much better to get through bad illness or surgery. Yeah, that's a good point. We can just replace those hormones. It's if our body's not making them themselves, they can be taken in a tablet form. So even in an instance where a child isn't making them adequately, there's an easy way to administer them, as long as we know about it. Yes, I have a question. Um, after my daughter had a major surgery for her back, mm -hmm. um, they had to give her a blood transfusion. And since then, we don't know if it's a correlation or not, her plates, platelets have been going down every year. Oh. And they're to the point where they're getting worried about it. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that can be done or is that a normal thing with SLOS? I haven't read about that. Has have you, any, go ahead, please. You have a panel of experts here in the audience. I, please take full advantage of that. Um, so um, sometimes because of the membrane problem um, that Dr. Williams mentioned, um, the red blood cells um, in your body are very, have to be very flexible to get into very tiny areas of your body and sometimes the red blood cells are misshapen in people with severe smithlomyopets because the amount of cholesterol in the membrane is very low. And then when that happens, your spleen is the organ in your body, sits in your abdomen, that filters out funky looking, funky shaped red cells. And I've had patients who have, developed, have their spleen working over time um, to filter out those unusual shaped red cells. Um, and in the process, they filter out everything else to all your other blood cells. And so I have patients who've developed um, low platelets um, as well as the funky shaped red cells because the spleen is, um, it's called hypersplenism. The spleen, the spleen is just working really, really hard to fix the funky shaped red cells and in the process, by mistake, filters out the platelets as well. And so some of my more severely affected patients have in fact been followed by a hematology specialist mm -hmm. um, to help with that. 
problem. If your platelets are low, you can't clot your blood well so you can bleed too easily with surgeries, and some of my patients have needed extra platelets to help them get through big surgeries. So probably unrelated to the blood transfusion? Probably not. Okay. 